This video was sponsored by Raycon. What do you want me to do? Wave a magic wand? Come on! And all new kitchen nightmares. Then, I think the children are the key. Gordon Ramsay is not God. That's a statement that is so obviously true that it feels pretty patronizing to even state it out loud. Like, oh, you think I needed you to say that, Jack Saint? You think I thought the big shout man was God? But what I want you to imagine is that for the purposes of his catalogue of shows, and in particular Kitchen Nightmares, the assertion that Gordon Ramsay actually is God is 100% correct. In fact, it is so incredibly correct that the entire premise of these shows completely fall down unless you believe it to be the case. Let's back up a second. I really can't overstate how much I love Kitchen Nightmares. It is my go-to show whenever I want to watch something without having to think about it too much. And even when I don't have time to watch a full episode, I'll usually just throw on a clip to listen to while I go for a walk or take a shit. If I want something a little more subdued and down to earth, I'll throw on an episode from the UK series. If I want some powerful drama and hijinks, Shut the place down! Get out of here! That's I have watched this video of Gordon Ramsay trying terrible pizzas over a dozen times at this point. It is, dare I say it, a problem. Ironically, given the nature of the show itself, I would define Kitchen Nightmares as the peak of junk food television. It has serious dramatic tension, it has incredible moments of hilarity, the narrative is self-contained and highly predictable. Gordon enters a dysfunctional restaurant, points out the many obvious problems, has a heart-to-heart -heart of the owners, and almost always they'll try to make necessary changes to their business, and it all comes out with a happy ending. Well... Almost always. Don't worry, I told them to fuck off. You want to fuck with me? I will fuck, with, will you. fuck with you. Then I will I fuck with you. you think that you can come in here and say these things. The right thing for me is to get out of here. It's voyeuristic and often exploits the deep personal issues of real-world people for cheap drama, but it has enough of a feel-good helping the underdog veneer that I don't feel as guilty watching it as I would with something like Dr. Phil or Jeremy Kyle. How can I do a television show if you won't talk? It's that veneer that I'm going to focus on today. The way Gordon Ramsay and his producers have, through Kitchen Nightmares, Constructed a reality designed to make you forget a fundamental truth about Kitchen Nightmares. That the purpose of this show is not to save failing restaurants. This feels like an odd thing to say considering the stated premise of the series is exactly that. It's the wager the show is invariably making to the audience, and what gives each episode most of its momentum. Can Gordon save this business, or not? But I think if you're trying to delve a little deeper into any consumer product, it's important to separate something's stated purpose with the underlying motivation surrounding it. For a basic, relevant example, look at junk food. The stated purpose is to feed you, but that's not really the sole or even primary goal for most companies pushing it out to the public. They want to sell you a flavor, to convince you to associate a specific taste with a specific brand and keep you coming back. There's a reason McDonald's burgers taste great, but also don't really taste like burgers. They taste like McDonald's. So, in the case of shows like Kitchen Nightmares, the stated goal might be to help save failing restaurants. But what they're really selling you is a brand. Among other things, the brand of Gordon Ramsay. Hey, do you generally dislike spending money? Do you also like listening to things with your ears? Well, like me, you may have a history of buying bad budget earphones and then having them almost immediately crap out on you, creating a cycle of purchases that could have easily been avoided if you just bought one reliable set in the first place. What is that reliable set, you may ask? Raycon. Specifically, Raycon's wireless everyday E25 earbuds sent over to me as part of the sponsorship for this video. They sound great, isolate noise like nobody's business, and start around half the price of other premium wireless earbuds on the market. So, if you're interested, check out buyraycon.com slash jacksaint for 15% off of your first order. Enjoy! 
It's hard to talk about Kitchen Nightmares without talking about its host, but I'll try to keep this brief. More so even than his abilities as a chef, selling himself as a brand has really always been Gordon Ramsay's most impressive skill. Most famously, he was able to take the bad press of his repeated abuses of staff and customers to his restaurants and flip that into a positive. A kind of, I'm just brutally honest and cut through the bullshit charm that effectively let him have full control of his own narrative. When good things are said about him, good. When bad things are said about him, well, that's just more whining from the snowflakes who can't handle his raw, unadulterated appeal. All press just became another opportunity to further reinforce his brand as, at the end of the day, a truth teller. I don't want to spend too much time here psychoanalyzing a dude who, when it comes down to it, I don't know. Honestly, depending on your motivations going into it, you could probably do a solid job framing Ramsay either as an abusive bully who exploits the people around him, or a noble, charitable figure who truly cares about furthering meaningful causes and helping people. As I've already said, I have a bitter, crippling addiction to binging Ramsay shows. And based on that, I have to admit, I'm gonna need to give a highly spicy take here. Gordon Ramsay is complicated. I don't think he's some shady villain completely indifferent to those around him, but it's also hard to ignore that a lot of harmful and abusive actions have come from him and his connected enterprises. This is all me underlining that this video is not about the ideology of Gordon Ramsay himself, as a complex and multifaceted guy who you'd probably need more than a few shows to really understand. But there's one thing I think I could say about Ramsay without much objection. He is a man concerned with authority. Donkey! The 1999 five-part documentary series Boiling Point is one of the first tastes most audiences had with Ramsay and his usual spicy hot demeanor. One minute from now, concentrate you. We just kind of your up for everybody here. We got the idea of the show was simple. Ramsay had made headlines as a young and highly ambitious chef who'd already been awarded two Michelin stars, among the most esteemed awards in his industry. And the show would document the opening of his new restaurant and his quest to get his third star. Now as I said, as far as the food industry goes, earning a Michelin star is a pretty prestigious honor, and it takes a pretty wild amount of ruthlessness and determination to get one at as young an age as Ramsay, let alone two of them, and especially let alone three. You can see all of that in the show. In his efforts to prove himself as a chef and restaurateur, Ramsay puts everything into his work um, here. You know, Gordon sort of comes and goes. You know, he comes when they're ready and disappears soon after. Frequently sparring with his staff, sinking his personal life, finances, and reputation to make his dream a reality. The question is, considering the massive toll of all of this, from the physical to the psychological, why was this such a dream? What does three Michelin stars prove that one or two don't? Again, it comes back to what we said earlier, Ramsay's worship of authority. The Michelin Guide Institution is, like Ramsay, not God. It was a marketing gimmick for a tyre company to increase demand for cars. Over the years, it has certainly gained a reputation, from a combination of hiring on similarly experienced industry professionals, being highly selective in who it awards, and, once again, good marketing. All of this means that, like the Academy Awards with movies, a Michelin star means something. In a way that, say, a five-star review from a trusted critic on Yelp does not. But, also like the Academy Awards, let's just say sometimes there's some disagreement with their decisions. Uh, and, the and the Oscar goes, goes to... to Green Crash. Green. Among other things, the Michelin Guide Institution has been accused of favoritism towards certain popular chefs, pandering towards region Michelin itself wishes to cater for, and engaging in an insidious form of cultural imperialism, with its clear bias towards French cuisine and fine dining experiences. None of this means necessarily that we just dismiss Michelin's judgement out of hand, but it does underline an obvious truth. Their word is not law. It's a brand you've been trained to trust. 
Which brings us back to Gordon Ramsay. I would be far from the first critic of Kitchen Nightmares to point out one of the most pronounced aspects of the show. Those fucking sound effects. Kitchen Nightmares is obsessed with ensuring its viewers are fed one specific narrative. Maybe more so than any other piece of media I have ever consumed. TV when customers come? Is that true? I don't, I don't think it's true. Do sashimi. Thank you. This is mainly in reference to the US version, and I am going to focus on that here, even if I do think the significant differences between its presentation and the UK original are worth pointing out. Let me explain what I mean. Obviously, all reality shows are constructing a highly selective view of the world. The logistics of production mean both space, in terms of limited cameras to film, and time, needing to edit down what's filmed to fit a specific slot, need to be taken into account. And you want to maintain viewer interest, so when you're editing, you're obviously going to bias towards editing together a story that's the most entertaining and easy to follow. The same reason these shows usually have a very predictable structure to them, and the people shown mostly wind up fitting pretty one-dimensional archetypes. Is this the lazy owner who just doesn't care enough? Is this the shouty owner who mistreats his staff? Is this Nino? Hello, my name's Nino! You add all this together and get, as entertainer Charlie Brooker once put it, a crude caricature of reality. But even then, Kitchen Nightmares takes all that and then just more. Like, there is no room for ambiguity. Every moment of the show needs to give you music, cut-ins, impact sound effects. It's Tom. On deficiencies. It's the reason I said I watch this show when I don't want to think too much. Usually I don't even have to worry about whether I'm supposed to like or dislike a person, agree or disagree. The show gives me special noises to decide that for me. And while that's such a clear, surface level part of the show, I think the mentality behind that seeps into every part of it. The authority that Ramsey commands, that he's picked up over years of financial success, professional accolades and controlling his media narrative are built on the same idea as this editing. It's tricking you into not really considering any alternate perspective. You can trust them. I remember specifically an episode of the show, this one set in Georgia, in which the managers of the black owned business Park's Edge complained to Gordon that one of the major issues they'd had was problems with racism in the local area, and how that that had been a big factor in their lack of initial success. Yeah, said the neighborhood could do better. Uh, we were not good enough for the neighborhood. And my response was they don't like us because we're a minority owned restaurant in a white neighborhood. The show mentions this and then just completely discards it offhand. For the entire rest of the episode, it just plays out as if this was obviously made up by the owners, with Gordon even exclaiming relief that customers had boycotted Park's Edge given management problems in the restaurant. Thank God the locals boycotted this place because if they ate here, they'd never come back. I obviously don't know enough about the history of that particular restaurant or that particular neighborhood to say anything about their claim one way or the other, but I do think the simple choice of handling the problem in this way is interesting in itself. By choosing not to treat this accusation with any real seriousness, the show is implicitly telling us this is not a big problem. We are not focusing on this, it doesn't really matter. And of course they would, right? Like, what if local racism was a big problem for this place? Can you imagine what a massive effect this would have on the structure of the show? To have such a significant stumbling block be something fully outside of the confines of the restaurant? That's like a major systemic problem, way outside of Gordon Ramsay's scope as someone who knows a lot about food and a lot about running restaurants. It would threaten the narrative of the show and the authority of Ramsay. And so, as quickly as it's brought up, it's gone. Incidentally, something happens at Park's Edge that happens to a lot of restaurants shortly after Gordon comes to fix them up and give them their happy ending. Something that also rarely gets brought up by the production. It closed. 
To date, most of the restaurants covered on the show have since shut down. Many of them closed down before the episodes they were filmed for had even aired. While a 2014 article stated that 30 of the 77 restaurants covered over the show's run were still running, a 2018 update showed that number had shrunk to 17. Wait, no, we're at 15 now. Gordon Ramsay's success rate with these restaurants is less than 20%. Now, you could look at that pretty uncharitably and wonder why he was ever really seen as some kind of trustworthy authority on this subject. But just as easily, there is a clear justification pre-built into the premise of shows like Kitchen Nightmares. The restaurants are already failing. Therefore, if they succeed, we can say that Gordon did his job and they successfully followed his advice. If they shut down, that was on them. They must have not followed what Gordon told them to do, or otherwise made some other mistakes that ultimately led to their own failure. Dave must have been the most arrogant restaurant owner I've ever met in my entire life. As I predicted, the Black Pearl is closed. Kaput, finished. Damn. As with his handling of the press, he can never really lose. In real terms, the fact that Kitchen Nightmare's success rate is so low is irrelevant. No matter how successful or unsuccessful the show is, any success is seen as proof of Gordon's good judgement. Now, I could spend time here getting into the times when the opposite appeared to be the case. On several occasions, owners and their clientele have reported that Gordon's changes actually made the place worse. Season 5's El Greco, which closed a few weeks after the filming of the episode, reported they were unhappy with many of the style and menu changes, something reiterated by local press around the area. According to the owner of Chappies, covered in season 6, Gordon's insistence on switching from authentic Creole dishes to generic crowd pleasers like burgers and fried chicken caused irreparable harm to his business. Again, I can't really say who's right and who's wrong here, but from the outside, all of this looks like it would undermine the entire premise of Kitchen Nightmares. What if the owners are sometimes right? What if Gordon is sometimes wrong? What if, as is the case for myriad struggling restaurants, there are many factors playing a significant role in their failings outside of just cooking bad food and having poor hygiene standards. It's not always just mistreating staff or serving frozen food, something Ramsey himself would know full well. But that is not the reality Kitchen Nightmares sells us. Through the brand of its host, through the unambiguous perspective of its editing, what we're being sold is a simplified, straightforward version of our world. A world based on individual choices, clear-cut right and wrong, where following authority means success and not following it means failure. Where Gordon Ramsay is God, and the world he offers is just. This is the bit where I talk about capitalism. Sorry. The Just World hypothesis states that for any person, their actions will ultimately bring about appropriate consequences. You do good, good happens. You do bad, bad happens. What goes around comes around, you reap what you sow. For obvious reasons, the idea that you reap what you sow plays pretty well into the justifying ideology of capitalism. I mean, when you break it down, the system kind of makes sense when you think of it that way, right? If you don't try your best, try hard enough, you'll fail. If you do, you'll succeed. In fact, to be really reductive about it, I think a lot of the more anti-capitalist types would probably be more into the idea if that was how the world worked. But it doesn't. The reality is that many hardworking people are not rewarded under capitalism, and that a multitude of factors play into their ability to succeed in the first place. Disability, mental illness, education, discrimination, maybe most obviously class position. Started off in Brooklyn, my father gave me a small loan of a million dollars. Wrapping things back to restaurateurs, it's a simple reality that businesses attached to large, well-funded corporations are much more safe and reliable investments than small-time independent and eateries. And to disguise all of this, we have thought leaders. People whose job it is to interpret the world for you, to have authority, and spin you a narrative that lets you ignore the messy complications of this reality. 
The Michelin Guide Institution is an institution of thought leaders. It is their job to tell you what is good taste and what is bad taste. Gordon Ramsay is a thought leader. It is his job to tell you what makes a person succeed and what makes them fail. And from all of this, we get Kitchen Nightmares. Junk food reality TV that we think is selling us the comfortable narrative that Gordon's here to help these well-meaning but incompetent people succeed. But what it's really selling us is a different comfortable narrative. As with my Jeremy Kyle video some months ago, a narrative that's complex, multi-layered topics are actually as simple as cutting through the bullshit, kicking people in the arse, and getting the individuals to make the right choices. And through its presentation, even through its premise, it grips you in that mode of thinking, and almost convinces you to believe in its simplified cartoon world, where Ramsey speaks the gospel truth, and the people need only follow it. But just because you're only getting one perspective, doesn't mean it's an objective one. What you're buying isn't the truth, but the brand. Gordon Ramsay may be an authority, but he is not God. Obviously, we can't just avoid the presence and even occasional usefulness of thought leaders in our everyday lives. Maybe sometimes a person who's really good at speaking with authority and getting you to see the world through their unique lens could change your perspective for the better. I mean, that's basically what I'm trying to do here, right? This stuff comes in degrees. As I've already mentioned, even within the realm of Kitchen Nightmares, you see a much more harsh and distilled form of this in the US version compared to the UK, and that is its own massive can of worms. But I think there is a fundamental harm that these kinds of manufactured authorities create. More than anything, I think it's important to both keep our perspectives broad, open to voices we might not traditionally associate with authority, and to be skeptical of our own bias biases in who we choose to listen to and who we choose to ignore. I don't think it's exactly a coincidence that the brand that's been created for Ramsey, especially in the US, is one of a very specific hyper-masculine, domineering, and aggressive attitude. The important thing I take away is to understand that we can acknowledge and respect the varied perspectives of those around us without giving up our own ability to see the world in all its nuances and complexities, to allow ourselves to disagree and to change. Without that, well, I guess we might as well be watching reality TV. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed the video. As usual, if you did, I hope you consider giving it a like, sharing it around, and if you really enjoy it, throwing me a buck or two over on Patreon. You can also use coffee for one-time donations. Donating gets you in the credits scrolling by now. Today I'd like to give a special thanks to A Recusant, Angerid Thomas, Atticus Cassidy, Benjamin David Zala Brown, Callan Stein, Connor D, Dapney, Ethan Volp, India, Leon Weigel, Lolzy Gag, Malpatuis, Nick Everett, Platypus Ego 7, Snowy, and Torin the Exile. With an extra special thanks to Charlotte Allen, Jamie Bellamy Mayer, Jay the Fool, and Ronald Maine. Finally, I'd like to thank Raycon again for sponsoring this video. Once again, check the link in the description for 15% off of your Raycon order. Other than that, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time. Love you all, and stay safe. Nino!